November 18, 2022. This is the Room Now podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. It's a few days after the end of the ACR annual meeting, Convergence 2022. The trip home was uneventful. The trip to Philadelphia was exhausting. Philly was great. The city is a great walking town. It's rich in culture. It's rich in history. It's uh, places to go to and dine and meet and mingle are bountiful. I must say the first few nights of the meeting were great catching up with a number of different people in some great places. Uh, And the weather was reasonable. Uh, Then... You know, I got there on Thursday. I left on Tuesday for what was basically a Saturday, Sunday, Monday meeting. Um, Again, Philly was great. Convention center, not so great. Not my favorite convention center. Not easy to navigate. Um, The people who worked there were nice, but you had to run between different buildings. You spend two days trying to understand the layout, and then you go home. It's really... Uh, as convention centers go, and then of course it's marred by everything is union driven. Like to get a light bulb changed, you need a work order and a thousand dollars. It's kind of ridiculous. So I wish the ACR wouldn't use the Philadelphia Convention Center. I wish they would have meetings in Philadelphia, just not the convention center. Um, well, they'll figure it out. What else? Uh, it was good to be back at the meeting. Um, while the crowds were down, Overall attendance was down about a third, and so it wasn't so crowded, you know, in the hallways or at the exhibit floors. Um, You know, it was great to see people. It was great to meet up with people. Uh, The funny thing is, there's a lot of people I didn't see at the meeting, although I know at the meeting because I saw them on the plane going home. Like, isn't that an an amazing phenomenon? Even with a a watered-down crowd, still finding your own folk at the ACR meeting can be uh, challenging if you don't have it prearranged. Um, navigating the meeting was difficult um, because of the layout. Um, I don't know what it was. I mean, there's plenty of time between sessions. I, I found it difficult to know where I'm going next. And usually, I mean, I spend the whole, you know, weeks before planning my, th- my, my hit list and the night before where I'm going to go. I just didn't find it very good because of a, being a shorter meeting. Um, I didn't have any meetings. I Lots of companies, lots of people wanted to meet with me. Um, I said, you know, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. So I, you know, I had to hold off people because, and I'm glad I did, um, because it just wasn't conducive. Um, there were a lot of great things about this meeting. My, one of my favorite was the year in review that featured uh, Dr. Carol Langford from the Cleveland Clinic and John Varker from Michigan. They really did just a bang up job. And then um, Ken Sag, you know, did a fabulous job with his uh, presidential address and, uh, you know, his enthusiasm was just fabulous for the awards and the recipients. And then he had a great session where he introduced um, uh, uh, Abraham Varghese from Stanford, well-known author who gave really an eloquent, spellbinding um, keynote address talking about um, COVID and uh, how COVID affected our lives. And he's, an, he's an, uh, a notable ID specialist, and he said he thought that the seminal event in his career was HIV, but it turns out it's probably COVID. And then he talked about COVID as being a repeat of history's greatest stories, beginning with Gilgamesh and Beowulf and lots of others. It's a monster tale, right? And what's great about monster tales that is that it involves heroes. And you were the hero. Physicians, healthcare workers were the heroes. Uh, and I think it was a really good, feel-good lecture. The audience loved it. Um, and he did a, a, an amazing job. Um, again, I think the one of the downsides of meeting was not having posters. And uh, you either had to find them electronically or go to the Ignite sessions, which were more like the Ignore sessions. Again, I don't know what went wrong there, but you, you, mo- nobody stayed at the Ignore sessions. You know, they were just out of the way little country fair stages with 
you know, I would have gone if I had a fellow presenting and then I would have left right after because there was nothing to keep me there in the layout and delivery. It sort of was a dud. But, you know, the ACR had to plan this meeting long before the meeting occurred, long before we knew the status of COVID and whether people would be running around with masks or not. And that is uh, was the challenge. It'll be much better next year. It'll be much better next year at ULAR as well. Finally, uh, my meeting report will end with the what I call the snack snark report, where, you know, where do you go on the exhibit floor to get a good snack or to get a good something to drink or whatever? You know, it's usually the snacks are bad. It's like biscotti that, you know, you can cause a brain injury with, or it's coffee. I don't like coffee. Like, where's the Diet Coke? You know, a bottle of water even, you know. But uh, this year, again, they're back with the coffee and not much else. Um, but they did have a number of like sweetie things, you know, cookies and brownies and you know, pumpkin p- cobbler and 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 one big exhibitor had Philly cheesesteaks. The line was big. Every time I went there to get a Philly cheesesteak, eh, it was too long. I had to be somewhere. And but the good news was on the last day when I went to get a Philly cheesesteak, who's sitting at, at the table but Charlie Dinarello? Charles Dinarello, inventor, you know, master scientist of IL-1 beta. I know Charlie a long time because of our common interest in IL-1 autoinflammatory and Stills disease. Got to sit with him, got to interview him, check it out on the website. Um, He's 79 now. He still has the same NIH grant that he renews every year because of high quality science. Um, Charlie Dinarello is a legend in the world of rheumatology, infectious disease, and immunology. So I'll give you a few um, abstracts to chew on. First off, making this list was a little bit hard because I've been talking a lot this week, and if you really want to digest this meeting, I'm going to give you but a taste of the things I really haven't talked about before. If you want to digest this meeting, you can either watch the video or the podcast for the daily faculty recaps. There's three videos, three podcasts. Or if you're a lupus or RA gal, you can look at the topic panels on RA, lupus, PSA, and SPA. Again, available as videos or as podcasts. Um, Last night, Artie Kavanaugh and I did a rheumatology roundup, a spirited one hour of, a brilliance and glib comment. Um, that's worth listening to as a video or a podcast. And then lastly, um, next week we're going to be rolling out topic podcasts. So we're, for those of you who are RA, PSA, spa, or lupus aficionados, we've compiled all the RA reports into one podcast that you might want to listen to while you're uh, walking the dog or folding the clothes. But today I'm going to talk about a few abstracts. Let's start with abstract 0338 from Yang et al. at the Mayo Clinic. Um, They talked about the likelihood of transitioning to systemic lupus once you're diagnosed with cutaneous lupus erythematosus. So they collected a um, cohort of 320 incident CLE patients um, using the Gilliam criteria for CLE. Jim Gilliam, a famous dermatologist from UT Southwestern, who I met when I was a first-year fellow. Amazing. Um, Anyway, they followed patients for a mean, I think, of at least eight or nine years. And overall, 26 of the 324, or almost 12%, went on to develop systemic lupus over time. Turns out that um, a little less than half would transition by year five, and that the rate of transition was about less than 3% every three every five years from years five through years 20. I've never really thought about this. I've seen a few cases of this, but yeah, patients with CLE, and that would include DLE and SCLE and other forms, can actually transition um, into systemic disease. Uh, abstract number 0246, Cindy Croson and colleagues also from the Mayo Clinic 
where they do a lot of great research, and they've been working hard the last few years on comorbidities. This particular report was a bit of a mind bender, a mind blower, if you will. They did a cluster analysis of several hundred lupus patients they followed over time and come up with four clusters, each cluster having uh, different outcomes, different phenotypic profiles, um, like cluster one, for instance, were younger patients that had very few comorbidities. And ultimately, they were looking at um, A, how many comorbidities you had in each cluster, and B, whether that cluster had a different outcome as far as mortality. Well, it turns out clusters one, two, and three, not so much. Um, cluster four, older patients with five or more, um, more or morbidities had a significant reduction in survival with, you know, the survival lines, mortality lines, one, two, three, being flat across the top and group number four taking a dive. Um, The interesting thing about this particular study, I think almost 60% had one plus, uh, no, over 90%, 92% had one or more comorbidities. And that almost, uh, I think it was 59% had five or more comorbidities. This is a significant change from years past. I've done other compilations of comorbidities in RA. And, you know, it used to be that, oh, I think the number was about 60% of RA patients had one or more comorbidities. In this study, it was 92%. The different thing, and, and then again, historically, it was two or more was seen in about 25%. And then in this study, 59% had five or more. What's the difference? My historic ones from, were from 10, 20 years ago. This one is more recent years, starting in two, 2015. So if this is true, you, the rheumatologist, have got a lot to worry about, meaning comorbidities are uh, on the rise, and when present in multiplicity, especially in your older RA patients, they kill. Now, all of you talk about comorbidities. You often leverage that to get your patients to comply or start therapy, But none of you are managing comorbidities. Everyone says, I don't do that. That's what the primary care does. The problem is your patients think that you're the one. You understand them. They don't follow up with their primary care like they should. You don't even mandate it. So either you start to get militant about comorbidity management and primary care co-management, or you need to take a serious look at your own practices and step up, identify comorbidities, start the management, and then use that as leverage to get patients to go see their primary care. Again, you know best what they should be doing. Abstract 0344, Shivani Garg from the University of Wisconsin had a novel analysis of hydroxychloroquine blood levels and what that meant as far as disease control um, and whether there were social determinants as to what happened. Turns out the social determinants were not very important here. But when I looked at hydroxychloroquine levels, they were either less than 500, 750, 1,000, 1,500, more up, you know, above or below. What they found was that if you were less than 500, that was probably a patient who was not compliant. But if they were greater than 500, they probably were compliant. Patients who were at 750 or 1,000 or above, but below 1,500, had at least a 75% lower risk of, 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 of flares. So that's significant. That's where your therapeutic levels are um, in, in, in this cohort. The, the worrisome ones were the ones that were over 1,500. They had more toxicity. Um, and then the other interesting part about this analysis was that they looked at, um, at blood levels according to renal status. So compared to stage one CKD, patients with stage two CKD or higher had a fourfold higher risk of super therapeutic levels and therefore a risk of toxicity, super therapeutic being greater than 1500 nanograms per ml. A really uh, nice, insightful abstract. Abstract number 1604, Kevin Dean and colleagues at the University of Colorado published the long-awaited results of the STOP-RA trial. To me, this is probably what I think was the most important study. At least I was looking forward to this the most, although it turns out to be a negative study. STOP-RA is an intervention in patients who may be at risk of rheumatoid arthritis. They enrolled patients with a high CCP, 
They didn't have to have symptoms. They just found these patients in all kinds of ways, fairs, relatives, whatnot, and they did not have to have you know, um, any or joint pain or, uh, or they did not have to be first-degree relatives. So it's kind of a loose definition of an at-risk individual, although it's CCP. And you'd expect that maybe you know, uh, 20% or more patients might develop disease. If it's a really high titer CCP, maybe 30%. So they actually um, took about five years to enroll this. This was difficult to enroll the study, especially during COVID. They um, prematurely stopped this trial for futility because when you randomize the 140 or so patients to either hydroxychloroquine weight dosed um, and or placebo, in the end, a third of patients um, developed RA and it didn't matter whether you're on hydroxychloroquine or not. Hydroxychloroquine, 34%, placebo, 36%, not significant. Hydroxychloroquine does not work in your patients who you think, I don't know, maybe they'll develop something. Let me give them something safe, something that works. Well, in this scenario, mm, not so much. Hydroxychloroquine would not be recommended. There were a number of different studies about early RA and preclinical RA. Um, listen to other podcasts and videos for more discussion of that. Abstract number 1117-1117 was a, a phase two study of ducravacitinib, the TIC2 inhibitor, uh, against placebo in patients with active SLE. So they had as a 48-week phase two study, 363 um, autoantibody positive patients who were active with a SLE eye of six or greater, randomized to either receive um, the ducravacitinib, uh, 3 BID, 6 milligrams BID, or 12 milligrams once a day, or placebo. Um, and, and at 32 weeks, ducravacitinib, 32, uh, 3 milligrams BID was and 6 milligrams BID were significantly higher than placebo. Placebo response about 35, 37%. The ducravacitinib, 3 milligrams BID, about 60%, a little less. Um, these results were maintained out to week 48. There were no particular adverse events of interest. There were no venous thromboembolic events. This is phase two. Lupus studies look great in phase two. Let's hope it looks great in phase three, which is currently underway. Lastly, abstract number L12, late breaker number 12, looked at first-line anakinra, the IL-1 receptor antagonist, in patients with systemic JIA. I like this because, as you know, this earlier this year, the ACR guidelines came out with recommendations on treating systemic JIA, saying that someone who's newly diagnosed and active with systemic JIA, it's okay to use a cytokine inhibitor, IL-1 or IL-6. In this uncontrolled, open-label study um, that collected data on 65 patients, 60 of them got anakinra first, and then five of them got anakinra after some steroids, and in the end, um, the outcomes here are excellent. You know, at, at six months, 72% achieved a complete response, meaning no, no disease activity and off of steroids. And that was maintained uh, out to 12 months. I think the number was 68%. So no new side effects or whatnot. An interesting uh, sub-study within this study was to look at whether they could identify those kids who developed this systemic JIA-associated um, interstitial lung disease. As you know, that's been reported. It's somewhat uncommon, if not rare. Um, it's thought to be maybe an allergic reaction of the dress type um, to this biologic, and there's some indication it may be restricted to a certain HLA group. So they did HLA genotyping, uh, specifically looking for hla dr beta one 1501 Turns out that the genotyping had no impact on A, disease outcomes or predicting disease outcomes, B, identifying people who were going to develop this um, uh, interstitial lung disease. There was only one case uh, out of the 15 cases who were HLA, HLA DR beta 1, 1501. Um, there's only one case suggesting it really doesn't have utility. But again, the takeaway here of value is that first line. IL-1 inhibition looks really good in kids with systemic JIA. Hope you enjoyed ACR as much as I did. Uh, we're looking forward to going again next year in San Diego. 
uh, and also in ULAR, which is coming up in June in Milan. Um, but we'll be back next week with another podcast for you. Take care.